we are fortunate to have with us Doreen and Mark Gunnar. Mark was born in southern France. After completing a degree in marine engineering, he began his professional career as a charter skipper of sailing yachts in the Greek islands. After delivering a sailboat to the United States, he stuck around to apprentice with a jeweler in Washington, D.C., and began pursuing another passion, the handcrafting of gold and silver jewelry. Doreen met Mark while he was in D.C., and she was freelancing in the local film industry after completing her B.A. from American University. Traveling together throughout the Dominican Republic, convinced the couple to marry, moved to San Francisco, and start a family. Their two children, Maya and Tristan, were born in 1987 and 1996. The family moved to San Francisco, from San Francisco to Oakland in 1989, and soon began building Imani, a Simpson 10.2 meter catamaran. They brought Imani to Sausalito's Galilee Harbor in 1994. In 1999, the family cast off for the adventure of a lifetime, a five year west about circumnavigation of our planet, which you'll be hearing about tonight. The, the Gunnar family and Imani have been back in Galilee Harbor since 2004. For the past nine years, Doreen has served as harbor manager for Galilee Harbor and as the Sausalito Parks and Recreation Commissioner. Mark continues to make handcrafted jewelry. He also delivers sailboats and coaches sailors who are pondering adventures of their own. Please join me in welcoming Mark and Doreen Gunnar. This is so weird to do this at home. <laughs> We've done this talk a, a few other times at yacht clubs and it's usually been a lot of strangers and it's really interesting to be in our backyard and to be doing this talk. And I really want to thank all of you for coming out tonight because we really appreciate that you have an interest in our story. <laughs> Next one? Yeah, that's good. Okay, come on. I get started. Here we go. This is Iman. This is, this is our home. We've lived on this boat for, it's been a long time. 20 now. years. 20 years. Wow. Yeah, 20 years we've lived aboard this boat. Um, when we moved on board, um, Tristan was six months old. He was born in 93, actually. Um, and Maya was six. And uh, we completed the boat in the harbor. Because um, when we first came to Sausalito, we just had the just the, the, the hull. The shell. Yeah. The shell. <laughs> and the insides were all done, but we still, Mark still had a lot of work to do as far as the, the, the rigging and all the metal work and the, the nets and all of that we did at Galilee the last two and a, it took us two and a half years to get the boat ready to actually go sailing. Yeah, that's right. Well, so uh, 93 was launched in 96. Uh, we just, I just finished to, uh, get everything more or less ready. And uh, we had our first sale in 96 in August, and in November we're going for the bar. So we really wanted to go pretty bad. <laughs> so we did three trips, uh, the winter, winter trips in 97, 98, 96, 97, 98, and spent six months in the bar and six months here. And then in, uh, in 99, December. In December 99, we just left again, uh, we just left the Marquesas and then went around the world for four, four and a half years. So um, this, is, this is the map of our route. Um, and as you can see, um, <clears throat> that we went straight from San Francisco to the Marquesas um, and sailed through French Polynesia um, and, and through the, the islands um, in the South Pacific and as far uh, west as Fiji before we go north again. So um, we'll start with that part of the trip here, and then we then there'll be more. We'll, there'll be more little maps. I'll show you more where we are. That's me. I was not a sailor. I was not born a sailor like he was. <laughs> he and his brother who's sitting over here. They all sailed, you know, from the time they were little, little. I did not do that. That was not my experience. Um, I used to go to camp in the summer. And, um, and I would row boats and canoe and that kind of thing at the girls' camp. And that's about as close as I got to boating when I was a little girl growing up. And I just happened to fall in love with a sailor, and that's how I became a <laughs> sailor. <laughs> this was a Marquesas of the, the yeah. uh,
Yeah, we're getting there. Um, the, the reality was, was taking two kids, by the time we left, they were, um, they were uh, six years old and 12 years old when we left for the Circle Nap. And, um, and we had homeschooled them. Um, Maya had not gone to school at all um, prior to this trip, but she was already 12. And Tristan, we were, at this point, just beginning to teach him how to read. There's Maya at 12. And uh, she did not want to go. <laughs> <clears throat> and all my neighbors in the Cali Harbor, y'all know that well. She did not want to leave. She loved it here. She used to work in this library when she was between 7 and, and uh, 11, 12 years old. She worked behind this desk every Thursday and helped, as Gloria knows, with her grandson, help check out the books and help the story time and all that. She was very much a part of this town and she really didn't want to go. But we left. <laughs> As she used to say, your dream is my nightmare. <laughs> I hate you. And she would not talk to me for months. And I was devastated because, you know, my little girl. But that was it. She was not my little girl anymore. So yeah, it took uh, some time for her to come back and to realize that actually it was a good experience. You know, she grew up out of that. She really uh, find herself. and. Uh, it was actually good, but it was tough for her for a while. Well, what you see here is... Um, $500. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> no, I'm joking because I, I was making jewelry as we uh, sell. And, and in the Marquesas, I show my jewelry to a gallery. You know, there's not much tourism there, but there was this lady who had some rooms and a little, a little museum. And, I show her my jewelry, she said, I love it all, but it's not for me. She said, can you make tickies? I was like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna make little tickies. <laughs> so I went to her beach and I grabbed some rocks and then I cut them in little tickies. And, and I just sell them to her for 50 bucks and it was 10 of them and it was $500. So I was like, here we go, for the next month, get the money. <laughs> So anyway, that's, that's not what I do normally. I normally use silver. This is just carved little rocks with a little pendant, and uh, that, was, that worked for, for, for her, so that was fun. Yeah. As you can see, our, our, our path that we, um, that we took brought us down through French Polynesia, through the Cook Islands, and then um, to, uh, to Niue, and north up to American Samoa, and down to Tonga, and then from Tonga to Fiji, and then we headed north from there when most of the boats go south. Um, and up through, uh, up to Tuvalu, and then up at the top there is Majuro and the Marshall Islands, which was the place to recharge the cruising kitty seriously, because then you can work there as Americans, we can work in those, in those islands. And then, um, and then we crossed over the Federated States of Micronesia, a couple of stops there, onto the Philippines. So that's our, yeah. Just a quick question. Yeah. Why did you make the choice to go north there? When Instead of going south? Well, I'm married to a Frenchman. Different, different reason, different reason, okay. <laughs> he wanted to stay in the tropics. He says, why would you go to New Zealand, go get cold? You know, he wasn't interested. Um, we weren't, and we had a cat. Okay, and, they, and importing a cat into both Australia and New Zealand is a very expensive endeavor, of which we, on our little shoestring, could not afford it. So all those kinds of things made us, and, we, and also we could go there and work, where you can't necessarily work in New Zealand, that's for sure, so that's why. I wanted yeah. to experience different culture that the Anglo again, so I wanted to see people from the island instead of going down to see the British people again. So for me, I had no interest in going to New Zealand or Australia. I wanted to see other people. That's why I was going around the world. So I had no interest in going down there. But I would love to go someday. But then it was not, <laughs> for me, it was not really interesting. So we went north and there's a lot of island. And uh, as the bad season, uh, arrive in November in uh, Tonga and Fiji, people normally go south for the hurricane season, but you have the other option of going toward the equator because there's no hurricane there. So there's a belt, uh, three, three, four degree north and south of the equator that don't have hurricanes, but the weather is not very good because it rains and there's no wind and it's just not very good weather, but uh, it's not bad weather. 
as regarding the storms. So that's what we did. And then in Majuro, uh, we had no idea, but I was lucky to work a lot and make a lot of jewelry. And then, as Dorit said, we finished the uh, cruising kitty. So that was actually uh, a surprise because we didn't know. So it worked out really good. Yeah, this is. Yeah. How was the ocean between San Francisco and, and, and um, about the crossing? Sure, I'll tell you about yeah, it yeah. The best, it, the best crossing we had. I know it was, it was amazing. We had um, we left here um, December 11th, um, and right after a uh, low had passed, just before, just as the as the high was, be, just as it was about to to set it, build in. That's when we left. And, um, and we had a 21 day passage that was just fantastic. 3,300 3, miles, so it close to uh, eight knots, uh, seven knots of bridge. Yeah. It was so good, it was, it was a really was good beautiful. passage. It was yeah. a beautiful passage. And in fact, um, at that time of year, um, leaving here, the ITCZ, which is that the, the belt, the big doldrum belt, where you can have a lot of no wind, or, and you know, they used to be called the horse latitudes. Um, in that area is really actually quite small at that time of year. So we actually had something like 12 hours of no wind in that section. We turned the engine on, ran it for those 12 hours, and then got on the other side, and all of a sudden we were sailing again, and it was great. So we really had consistent wind on that passage. It was really, and we arrived on uh, New Year's Day 2000 to Hiba Oa, and it was a really magnificent landfall, I have to say. These are what some of these islands look like over there. It's very, um, rock, there's, a, there's just a lot of character. There's a lot of character in the islands and in, in, in the Marquesas. Um, these, are, these are warrior people and this is a warrior feeling kind of place. It really does. Um, it, it has a lot of character, and yet at the same time, there's tremendous flowers and there's a fragrance about this place that as, you, as we got closer and closer to the island, because the first thing you see from afar is just all these rocks and whatnot. I said, wow, you know, that's, you know, Maya, when she saw it from very far, she was like, it's like Baja, you know, rocks. <laughs> she kind of went back inside and they are done that, you know? And then we got, as we got closer to the island, just the fragrance of the Tahiti Tahari flowers and the Majapan and, and, and Majapani and all those um, those incredibly fragrant flowers really hit you in the nose. I mean, it's amazing after not spelling anything but kind of salt air for 21 days. It really was pretty cool. And there's no tourism in the Marquesas. Uh, so uh, the place hasn't changed and doesn't change very much at all in the last 10 years. We went back in 2009 and there was just cell phone and bigger cars, but everything, that's it. Everything else was the same. So it was nice to see the place uh, doesn't change very much. Yeah, we, we were lucky on this trip. Um, we actually had crew. Um, her name is Anne um, to Le Monde, which is means all the world, which is pretty cool because she really was a very worldly lady. And, um, and we were bringing her back to French Polynesia where she had met her husband and had her children. And, um, and so it was really cool. She'd been working with a French American school and she was just finishing her term and her kids were going off to college, had gone off and she was on her own for the first time. She said, I need to go back there. So she actually was our crew um, for, for the, the Polynesian part, the, the French Polynesia part, which was wonderful to have another mom type person around with two kids around. I gotta say, I, I understand this, you know, this extra wife around thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it in the sense of the of, of, of being able to share the, the cooking and all that stuff and the kids and you know and they really loved her too. It was great. It was really wonderful to have her with us. And this is one of the islands where uh, the horses are own, owned by somebody, but they look like they're just wild because they just roam around anywhere, everywhere. And uh, we just saw a lot of horses. I mean, me and Tristan went to a botanical garden to collect some, some fruits, and they were all everywhere, all over the place. That's uh, Aka, Akahau? No, this is Tawata. Okay, that's in Tawata. So that's, that's Tawata. another island where they also have horses. Oh, horses. Eh? 
they use that to carry the copra from one side to the island to the other. Yeah, and once they get the copra to the other side of the island, then they just cut the horses free again. Mm -hmm. So they have to round up the horses every time to go get the copra and bring it to the other side. It's really... It's, it's really <laughs> Yeah, um, this is a, an example of the, the fruits that, that there is lots of in these islands. Um, the Marqueses were, uh, had lots of people in them many years ago. Um, where they said there were probably more like 40, 50,000 people. And now in all the Marquesan islands, there's more like 7,000 people. And yet, the food that is planted there could sustain probably 40,000. There's a lot of food growing all over the place. It's amazing. And, um, and so you meet people. It, it's how you, you don't go and buy food. People, you know, you, you make friends and they give it to you, you know, and it's kind of how it all works. You know, it really is part of, uh, you, get, you become affiliated with a family and you're their, you're their person and they, and they give you food. That's kind of really how it works. And we share what we have, you know, and it was great. It was, we really met a wonderful family that we went and saw again 10 years later when we went back. And um, it was so cool because they said to us, they said, oh my God, you, you came back. Everybody says they're going to come back, but you actually did. <laughs> it was great. It was really, really cool. And that's a bread fruit, fruit tree over there on the right. And another one of these. But the, the, that's what I'm saying. The trees are huge. Everything is big. And there's lots of food. And that's in Nukuiva and a little bit uh, in the land from the, the harbor, the main harbor. And that's uh, one of the old uh, sacred places where they used to have uh, festivities and you know, sacred things happening there. I don't really know exactly what they were doing. but. Uh, They've restored it, and they have every three years they have in the South Pacific. They have a big festival where people come from all over the islands and reunite and do their songs and do their dance. ceremony, yeah. their dance, and so yeah. that's very big in the yeah. South Pacific. It happens there. It happens in in Fiji, in different parts of the world. That's that's Nukuiva. So that's the capital of the Marquesas. You see behind the mountains are amazing with big waterfalls. And uh, this time we had a little issue with uh, an escape hatch because if uh, this boat will turn around, then we have ways to actually access the inside from. If we were to capsize. If we were to turn around, yeah, capsize. So there was a leak on the escape hatch, so at high tide we put the boat to the to the to the beach, and then when the water went down, went to work yeah. and so, sealed everything. Yeah. And then when the tide just go back up, then we did go to go back at anchor. Yeah, you're, you're always doing um, boat repairs in beautiful places. <laughs> so do you always uh, stop at these islands to stock up on food? Oh, always. Oh yeah, and you're constantly. You, you have to get serve. more food all the time. That's how something that... It? Well, okay. Um, you, the, the key is, is that um, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, fruits and vegetables, you're going to eat those. I mean, they're, those are just not something that you're preserving. We would can meat. Because uh, we had no refrigeration on the boat the entire time, and um, and we would and so we would get like a leg of lamb and put it in you know and process it in the pressure cooker and you know put it in those mason jars and put them on the shelf. Catch a big fish, which would all sometimes happen. These giant fish you'd bring on board that you know you get like one two meals and you three meals and then you're like oh my god I can't eat more fish. So we would can that as well. You know we got huge tuna mai mai. Um, Trevally, you know, it, it's just so, so I had at least um, two cases of canning jars on board. Um, as far as butter and cheese, we would put those in, um, butter, put that in brine, uh, just a watery brine, um, and, um, and also cheese, you could, we used to, initially you're putting those in oil jars, you know, jars of olive oil, you know, um, to cut up hard cheese and put those in there like that. There's lots and lots and lots of tricks. Um, so and, what you could, yeah. uh, what you could preserve. What did you have to buy? Oh, then you're just you, well. When, it's not that you want to. You want to buy fresh food everywhere you go. The preserved food is just for when you don't have the fresh. Is often what you're doing. 
Because then you'd be buying, you know, you'd buy like a lamb from, from New Zealand that was often in the shops. Lots of French food. Lots of French food. Pate. So you and, have all the delicacy, um, uh, French, expensive, but you can find everything. Yeah. Coming on boats. There's a boat going from Tahiti, going through the Tuamotu, which are the islands between Tahiti and the Marquesas, and delivering beer and material for building, you name it clothes, food, you know, whatever the order the months before comes into the boat. What about water? Water, we were catching water, which we'll show you. Rain Pretty water. Rain, yeah, rain water. We call it sky juice, yeah. and we drink a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is Roroya. This is uh, one of the Tuamotu um, atolls that we, that we went to. It, we came to this one in particular because the kids had been reading the Contiki. And this is where the Contiki made landfall, was at this particular atoll. So that was our reason for going there in particular. And, um, and, but to get in, you've got to get in the pass. And, um, and often the water is flowing out of the pass, and you've got to have to wait to a certain tide. It's almost like coming in the Golden Gate, you know, where you don't want to be going against the tide. You've got to kind of come with it. And we had to wait a little bit outside of, to be able to make our way in this pass. It wasn't that easy. We, had, we did like two attempts that didn't quite work, and then finally the third one, we threw the dinghy in the water, put the engine next That's to right. it. That's right, yeah, we had two engines yeah. We have a, on the, on the boat, we have a 9.9 .9 Yamaha outboard engine, so we don't have two diesel, like a lot of catamaran, bigger out. So we had to put the dinghy in the water with the dinghy, uh, the engine of the dinghy, which was then a 10 horsepower on the four stroke, <laughs> and put them full speed and go fight, fight the tide to get in. But, if we had waited two hours, then we would have been fine, but we didn't know that. We were nervous. <laughs> we were like, oh my God, we're Because what's happened in the atoll, you have on the, on the east side, you have waves coming and flooding into the atolls, filling up the atolls, and then this is the only place that the water can go out. So if there is a lot of storm, it is a lot of it's high tide and the storm, the, the, the atoll filled up and then comes out through that pass. So, uh, and then there's a tide, a high tide and low tide. So if you're not sure exactly where the tides are, then you're not sure. And it was the first time in, the, in, in this kind of uh, sea, sea world, so we didn't know exactly what to do. We learned, we and learned. Then it was easier <laughs> after, but, uh, but that was good. And that's what Dorian Tristan is doing right now. We have a big awning, <coughs> big trapeze-shaped awning, and then there's a full hall that you see on the top and the little line that pulled the awning down, so when it rains, the water just pour down there, like a big shower. Like a big funnel. It's yeah. basically, we, we turn the awning into a funnel where it catches it in the, in the, in the outer stretches and it pulls it down and it just comes right down into the... So we have a hose that's connected to the floor that goes directly into the tank. Right. So once the awning is a little clean of salt and so. We take showers under there, we fill up cooler to wash clothes, we fill up jerry cans, and then, and then it stops raining. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's how we get water. That, that so was for, a, and for, in fact, through most of the Pacific, we, we did mostly catching. Um, we caught all the way from, I guess, to the Philippines. That's when we were, we were catching the entire time. That's uh, one of the gentlemen from the uh, Tuamotu uh, growing pearls on his own. So there's a French government uh, organization that helped the guys to, to do the pearl, but he was on his own, this one. And he, is, uh, op he opened the uh, uh, an oyster and then he took out the, the first pearl, meaning this oyster has been in the water for a year and a half. Uh, a year and a half later, he dropped a little white bead in a special place in oyster and leave it there in the water for a year and a half come back, open, take the pearl out, and put another white little bit, a little bit bigger, in the same place, put it back in the water for a second time, do this a year and a half later, and three times they use the same oyster for getting free pearl. And every time they're different, and there's only 10% that are perfect. So, uh, and then eventually they do a type of moby pearl where they glue something on the shell and put it back in the water, and the oyster covers it and then they eat, they eat the oyster at the end. <laughs> and every time the oyster grows a little bit, no, every, because it's just a, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. it, yeah. it gets bigger. So um, here we are between the islands. When, he gets, when we run out of wind, everybody jumps in. Goes swimming a little bit. And it's very hot, so you it's, know, it's really refreshing to, uh, yeah. to, go, to go swimming. Yeah. Yeah. It's best. 
So these are the society islands, um, which are, it always felt like it was a combination of both the Marquesas and the Tuamotus because these islands have the big island in the middle and then the fringing reef, the little motus, just like we would find in the Tuamotus around that island. So it was really amazing to, to experience these islands because they are very special, gorgeous. When we got to Bora Bora, um, by this time we had connected with, uh, with, with more kid boats, which was wonderful and made Maya very happy. She kind of came out of her room, out of her shell, and all of a sudden she was having a good time. So life was really good when she connected with the two little girls on the end who were on the boat called Flyer. And then this other little gal who was from, um, they were from, God, they were from everywhere. Their father was Polish, the mother was French. The kids had Australia, New Zealand, and, and French, and, and, um, and Polish nationalities. I mean, it was just, they were all over the place, really neat family. And, um, and we ended up spending about two or three weeks um, just southeast end of Bora, um, across from one of the Motus. And the girls got permission, because all those little Motus are owned by people, but they got permission to camp on the beach for three days by themselves. No little brothers, <laughs> parents. They did it. They did everything themselves. They had the best time. That's Maya's home. <laughs> and she was going to get, they would start the morning with their drinking, like everybody now is running around drinking that coconut water. Well, that's what she's going to get. <laughs> The, um, from uh, we also spent a good amount of time in Taha and Rayatea, and that's where they grow the um, the, the uh, vanilla. And then Tristan at six, seven, six, six, yeah, six, six very serious. He was a he was our driver. You know, he would come <laughs> right to the rim to be to show back and forth. So he was just in charge, and he just loved that. Yeah, we just got a new engine. And, um, that's and that's what it was. Once he could, when he could, this engine, anybody could start, including Tristan. So he was like, oh yeah, he was, that was it. He was, he was just born to drive. <laughs> and so in, we stopped in the Cook Island in Rarotonga, the capital of the Cook. And then the album master, as we were leaving, told, told me, oh, why don't you, are you going to the beverage, to, stopping at the beverage reef on the way to Tonga? And I would just look on the map, he showed me on a map on, the, on his wall and he said, this is a reef that you have to stop. So I said, okay, cool. And it's basically a, a reef in the middle of the Pacific. So you have no palm tree, no beach, nothing. Just an open reef. The opening is in the west because the predominant wind comes from the east. So the, everything is pushed onto the, onto the reef and the opening is in the west. And we came in one day, we went in the south, followed the reef and came in the pass. And there was already three, four boats inside. We could see the mast, and then we anchored. It was like 30 feet. It was perfect, and Everywhere. there was no it was amazing. there was no uh, obstruction inside, so it was very safe. And we anchored there, and we spent a week there, uh, <laughs> swimming and getting lobsters and swimming the pass. So again, the current come in and out of, of the reef, and with the tide also act there. So you see the reef coming up and down. Yeah. And then uh, we were a few boats because you can't make any mistake there in the middle of the Pacific. So you you know you can't have an engine quitting on you and being pushed by the wind and you know etc. So and with another boat or two we just go together and then uh, dive the pass. So as the current goes out, you just dive and then the current makes you fly down there. It's wonderful. And it's just amazing. Just sharks down there. It's everything. And it's just, it was amazing. It was just an amazing experience to, uh, to dive the pass. Yeah. It was a current. It's called drift diving. And, what, and basically what you're doing is, is uh, underneath the water, there are, there are canyons. There are pinnacles, there are, I mean, there's just incredible formations down there that you're just being pushed with all the other fish, and you can see the whole, and the visibility was incredible. It's like 120 feet visibility from top to bottom. So you're seeing all the different layers of, of, of sea life, and, and they're all, it's just, it was just magic. We, we couldn't leave. Uh, we, we thought we'd be there a day, and we spent a week, because it was just too much fun. And other boats would come in there and they'd say, 
but what do you do? Where do you, there's just nothing here. You know, they just like, they, they'd stand on their boat and they just kind of look around and there's no beach to go comb, there's no, you know, there's no shelves to go Stop. gather. There's no, they say, said, so you gotta get in the water. <laughs> this is where it all is, you know, you put your mask on, you gotta go get in it because that's where the action was there. Yes, and, uh, and there's no village, is there? Mm -hmm. Do you have tanks or were you just snorkeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we snorkel. We, I have tank as a safety uh, device that I need from time to time. So I am have basic equipment just in case I need to go down for an emergency and I've been using it from time to time. But no, this is all snorkeling, you know. Yeah, this uh, is just snorkeling. And in fact, one of the guys we were, one of the boats we were with, that guy, he could uh, free dive, you know, 90 feet. So we are just watching him, you know. He was like, he was like watching TV, you know, to be able to see Bill with the sharks and everybody <laughs> down there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, here we are. Everybody is so excited. It was a really great time. You know, after you come up, everybody's just all giddy. From, from there we went on to Niue. Um, this is an amazing island. If anybody goes in the Pacific, if you don't go to Niue, shame on you. Because this place is sheer magic. It is the largest raised coral island in the world. Um, it is a one island nation of about but they have like 1,100 people. Well, <laughs> yeah, they, they don't, nobody knows exactly because they have some aid for the number of people live there, so it's just kind of, they don't, we don't know exactly how many people live there. Normally 1,200, yes. but, uh, so it, there's no place to anchor, so they've set up some moorings, and actually in latitude 38, lately, the boat, the catamaran, had an issue with their mooring, and they end up on the reef in the way. they weren't on the Yacht Club mooring, they're on a commercial, they're on a different mooring. I don't know yeah, which one. I read that. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, but so, I was wondering about that, because those moorings were so good there. Yeah, when and, we were there, and the like, visibility was, a while. was also amazing, yeah. because there's no rivers there to to uh, get the water dirty, so the visibility, again, was 100, 120 feet. We yeah. could see the line down in the water to the block of semen down there. It was You could see the mooring all the way down, like like it was like right next to you, and it was and like 125 feet down there. Is there springs on the, on the island for water? No springs. That's it. That, but there were some, but you'll see. There is some springs. There are some springs in this island. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, but in the, um, the anchorage, there was a humpback whale who had just had a baby calf, and she would show off her baby every morning and evening. You know, to like, it seemed like she was just like dancing amongst the boats, saying, "Look at my baby, she's beautiful." You know, <laughs> because it, it was just incredible. And so, you know, people we had to just get in the water a little closer and see it. It was amazing to swim with the humpbacks. So we we did swim very close from the mother and the baby. It was magical. Yeah. So it, so this at this this uh, for some geolo geological reason this at uh, this uh, island was raised from the bottom, so it's all coral that shouldn't have been underwater, that suddenly came up, and that's just being eroded now with the rain, with the wind, and so you have a lot of uh, tunnels, a lot of places where people go in, under the island, in the island, and then all kind of really unusual formations and, and fjords Beautiful. and crevasses, and they call them, how do they call the name of those? Uh, anyway, they have a name for the formation, but uh, it was amazing, it was really, uh, Stunning. And then, and then you'd have this going on that island too. You know, you'd have this real jungly part with, you know, where it, it was just really, it was a really unusual island. And again, go get the, go get the drinking nut. And um, and then these oasis kind of places that you would just find after being in all these little rocky places, you end up in a place like this. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it's a really cool place to go visit. Very unusual. Yeah, I can see the gray rocks. They're very, very sharp, very pointy, uh, eroded by the limestone. Elements. Yeah, right there. very unusual. And it, the, the 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 people have built steps, and they've made it easy access to the tourists, so you can swim in safely. They built all kind of uh, steps and uh, access. Yeah. And uh, after that, we went north up to Samoa and to to get the. Uh, school books and all that shipped in from the states because they have American, um, in Samoa there was a U.S. Postal Service, so that was kind of a good thing to do and Mark could send some, ship out some jewelry and so we kind of did a little business there and then headed down to Tonga 
And in September in Tonga, it's like all the boats that are in the Pacific all end up there. So it's a huge reunion. <laughs> yeah, Tristan was extremely excited because we were finally at a place where uh, this kind of fruit, like uh, pineapples and watermelon, was not terribly expensive, which it had been. And, and we were in, um, even in the Cooks and, and in uh, Nui, it was, like, he saw a watermelon was 20 bucks. And I had to tell him, no, we're not getting a $20 watermelon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we got to Tonga and we could buy everything. Because <laughs> it was really, it was very recently priced and there was lots of food. And so he was, he was so excited. <laughs> Yeah, this is a little village um, on one of the islands in, in the Babau group that we that we went to and vi we visited a school there, and um, and Mark um, he made a clock for them because they didn't have a clock on the wall in the school, and so he had those clock bits. We made a special clock for them. Yeah, and this was one of the guys in the village who who welcomed us uh, in and, and showed us around. Really lovely people, just very very incredibly welcoming. From there, we headed to Fiji, and uh, we decided to stay um, in the eastern part of Fiji, the um, kind of the really greeny part. It rains a lot on the Sen. Um, and uh, but really cool. It was a great, great place to go. Lots of waterfalls, but life does go on. Still gotta get your hair cut. <laughs> This is a Mayu Mayu. This is a pretty funny story. When we were, um, we, we had met two other boats, two other catamarans that had kids on board. They both had two, two kids on board. And um, Magic Happens and Shady Lady were the two boats. Um, one from Hong Kong. Um, Shady Lady was coming from Hong Kong that way. And then the uh, other boat was an Australian boat that was up. Um, uh, and uh, so they had left before we had to, to find an anchorage, because we had we were in the main town, and now it was time to go adventure. And and, um, and as we were approaching the anchorage that they that, that they were at, they got on the radio. I said, "Oh yeah, we're almost there." They said, "You better put your lines up." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, there's a there's a fee to get into this anchorage. You've got to get one mai mai before you can come in." <laughs> so you put up your lines, and boom. That's what we got. <laughs> it was crazy, and it was in every one of them that had come in, because they each had come one day at a time, and everybody caught a mai mai, and one bigger than the next to get in there. So it was pretty, pretty cool. Great fish. And that's where we ended up together. We all roughed up together in this hurricane hall, so it's a very safe. It's a reasonably safe place to uh, spend the hurricane season in in, uh, in Fiji, and some people do that. And so we had a big party here. We helped each other, climbing masts and fixing things and sharing things. And the kids were all going from one boat to the other, and so that was that was really cool. We actually had Halloween <coughs> rafted up like this, and, and and those kids from Hong Kong and in, in, uh, in Australia didn't know anything about Halloween, so. <laughs> Our kids instructed them very well. And the boat on the right, uh, talking about engine, the boat on the right, I think it was for 40, yeah, it's an Australian designer, but for the sailor in the boat, in a room, just to understand that uh, this boat had two engines like I have, so 299 Yamaha four-stroke, which is a big propeller, so which works. So instead of having one like I have, it was bigger, but they had two of them, so. And the, the middle boat was a prow. And the middle boat is a British design British. Pratt, which has a, a small diesel uh, with a sonic drive in the middle, and that works fine too. Whenever you come into one of those little coves in Fiji, you have to get permission to be there. And, um, and you have to bring the Kava route, um, and, and they call it doing uh, Sebo Sebo. So we, there we are. Um, tying up to their perfect dock, everything all lined up. I mean, it was just gorgeous. This place was amazing. Um, to go to have the ritual with the, with the chief of the village. And uh, that was really cool. It's pretty, you know, it, it felt like another time 
but it really was about asking permission to be there. And at the end, um, they gave us permission for, we could fish in their waters, we could, we could take water from their, their, their spigot, and you know, it was a whole thing of, of getting the permission for us to be there. And this is the village. And we kept on going north toward uh, the market uh, Majuro in uh, the Marshall Islands, but on the way it was Funafuti and Kiribati. So we made a, a stop in the capital in Funafuti, and we're really lucky to have uh, some local uh, activities. People come from other islands, and then for some celebration, to uh, a lot of eating. It was their uh, election. Poli political it was their election. And dancing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> They had some funny, funny thing like they will, uh, they had talk, and then they will throw talk to each other and perfume as they dance. It was really interesting, and and then there was an incident with a, a crew. Yeah, yeah, we um, there were a number of crews, um, what we call cruisers, other sailors, um, who had come to visit the island, and um, and in this that big room that we're in, it has a lot of different entrances all the way around. It's kind of a circular space. And all around those places, you there are there are doors, you know, not really doors, but just entrance openings, entrances, and there and everybody's shoes are at every you know nobody wears shoes inside of there because it's a sacred space, and so we you know when we got there we you know we did what everybody else you just you're always that's the one thing about this kind of travel is that you find that you have to pay attention a lot, and you're just always watching everybody else to kind of figure out what's going on because they're not speaking your language. You're not speaking there, so guess what? You better, you got to pay attention. And you just kind of watch everybody, and we kind of took our shoes and left them outside, just like everybody else. And just as we got in the door, we, you know, there were there were people all sitting on the floor everywhere, and the middle of the room was fairly open. But we just kind of ended up with this family, and they kind of sat near them, and they often everybody has food. They've got all this food laid out on the floor on their mats, and they're all eating and talking and not going on. And this other couple, they came in after us, um, after we'd been there, I don't know, a few, you know, 10, 20 minutes, and they saw somebody on the other side of the room after they'd taken off their shoes, they got to the indoor, they saw somebody over there, they met the night before, and, and they walked across the room. I'm gonna tell you, it was like EF Hutton. That place just went, <laughs> I mean, all that jibber jabber, everything stopped. <laughs> They were not supposed to do to cross the room. And, the, and there Some was a huge thing. intake of breath in that room. I mean, they just went, oh. Are we going to kill them? You know, it's like this <laughs> moment of what's going to happen to these people, yeah, it was, you know? It was really bad. And it was really bad. It was really this moment of, and there they are in the middle, you know? <laughs> and, and I was thinking, that was me. I'd be backstroke. I'm like, nobody's been. <laughs> but no, they just went right across and went to those people. like, Oh my God, and then it turned into this huge discussion amongst the elders and the people for like 20 minutes of what was going to happen to those people. That, that what was going on, and it was like, we're just sitting there, we're kind of eating. And, and in the end, um, the, the, the village elder, he explained that he told us, because he did speak English, he said, I had to explain to everybody that these people just don't know what to do, and it was a mistake that that was not something intentional and all that. But that was one of those moments of you really have to pay attention because sometimes things that we do and think nothing of is really an affront to their their culture and um, and the way they do things. That's some, so the Marshall Islands are a bunch of atolls again. So there's uh, motus on the outside, a big lagoon on the inside. Once you find the pass and you go in it safely, you're inside the atoll. It's very protected from the swell. And uh, we spent uh, three months, four months there where I was working a lot there, making all kind of custom jewelry. And here we see Maya uh, doing her chemistry and then Tristan studying. Yeah. Yeah. As they would do every day, just yeah. by themselves. Yes. Did you have a ham radio or something for communications and weather? Yeah. Yeah, we have a short band radio. Yeah. yeah. And a VHF. 
as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. We, yeah. we do have that. Then we use it uh, related, uh, connected to the computer to do weather charts all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. yeah, the computer was really important actually. Um, it really did keep us in as far as the weather was concerned to get those weather facts as print, you know, to come out. And, and, and Wi-Fi, and, you know, even in the Marquesas, now you have a hotspot, so you go in the main anchorage in the Marquesas, you put your antenna outside, you go to the, to the to a store and buy your card for so many minutes or whatever, and then you are Wi-Fi and you're on the web, so it's really amazing. So from there, when we left, when we left Marjoro in Marshalls, we headed um, to Koh Rai in, um, in, in Micronesia, as well as Yap. And thereafter, we crossed into the Philippines. We crossed the Philippine Trench and ended up in the Philippine Islands. Um, and that's our path through the Philippine Islands. Um, and we'll kind of explain why. It's a little convoluted. Normally, we kind of go straight through the sea and come down to Palawan. But no, we couldn't do it that way because not long after we got there, um, the Abu Sayyaf, which was a, a terrorist organization, actually um, grabbed 25 um, uh, resort workers and tourists and took them hostage. And so that made for, uh, you know, all of a sudden our trip, we had to deal with a political situation at the same time and try to understand where was a safe place to be and, and, and really try to um, keep ourselves out of any uh, out of any harm's way, that's for sure. But yeah, but here we all are, you know, because uh, we were still having fun. I have to say, we the the Philippine people were really wonderful, and we and we had some friends um, who came and visited us um, and spent ten days with us. Um, our friend Gary and his wife, and Gary, he um, was born in Chicago to two Philippine uh, parents, and he had never been to the Philippines before. And so um, he came, they came and met us after he had visited um, his extended family just north of Manila. And then they came and joined us on Imani. And we really, really had a great time together. That was really fun, he and his wife and son. And, um, and, and that is important in this travel, when you're traveling for years, um, that those visits that you get from home are even more important than they than you can imagine um, to to be able to show your friends what you're experiencing to share because every time you're doing these things you're going oh my god if so and so they should see this oh if they only you know if they were here it'd be like that so it's great to to um, to be to be able to share the experience we always loved having um, family and friends come and join us um, I'm gonna deviate a little bit from the the slideshow to I got a little bit of um, of a, a video to show you um, only because it's pertinent and I think it will give you a sense of, of what it was like on board the boat um, while we were in the Philippines making our way out of the um, out of out of the country we ended up in kind of a situation that um, I'm gonna let it speak for itself. Maya. Where are we going? Uh, this is Maya. Uh, no, just I'm finished not. Uh, <laughs> a meal here, lunch on the 4th of July here in the Philippines. That's Doreen, 4th of July. And Tristan, oh, Tristan, where is it? Tristan is hiding. hiding. He's He's hiding. Uh, this is, oh, oh, Tristan is outside. Oh my god. What's happening outside? Let's see. Oh. It's a typhoon. It's a typhoon. Oh, it's a typhoon. <laughs> Typhoon, here we go, Tristan. And the dinghy and the coast. Uh, it was pretty close. Tristan, show us. The beautiful village. And the wind is coming 30 35 knots right in here.
at the front end here. Simani is finally moving again today after a very quiet day. Hello, Mr. Tristan. Hello. What's new with you today? Ah, uh, I had a tooth. Touch the tooth. Show us which tooth. Ah, uh, yeah, that tooth. Looks like any minute now it's coming out, huh? Maybe. All right. What do you want from the tooth fairy? Cherries. <laughs> That's a tough find out here. This is where we are right now. Out here. In the wilderness. In the wilderness next to Palawan. There's Palawan out there in the distance. And then you can't see it anymore. No, you can't see it anymore. It's back there. Did you double the anchor there? Yeah, I'm not let him tell you about the anchoring situation, sure. Yeah, we, we actually ended up on the edge of a typhoon. Uh, we stopped in that place thinking it was just a, a squall, like it happened a lot, and it turned into three days of having between 35 to 55 knots of wind constantly, and that's the 4th of July, and we had no idea. Uh, we could not move because we were stuck there, and as you see behind the boat, the reef is there, maybe 40, 40 50 feet behind. So if anything happens, we washed on the reef. So that was not a good place to be. But so we, we had some help from the locals that kind of were watching us as they were trying to find. They know we're looking for a place to anchor and it's pretty deep. But there is an area with sand and a guy from the beach was say, okay, okay, you know, here, here, here. So I'm looking, looking around and see some white spatch and put the anchor on sand, which is what you want. And then we had an anchor holding. And then uh, I put my diving gear the day after, the day after put my diving gear and uh, there was some uh, buoys, some uh, moorings not too far, so I went to check out what it was and there was some uh, yeah, they, had, they had told us that we could use those moorings as well if we wanted to go get on the mooring. And, um, and Mark thought, no, because then it was really deep there and you'd just be on that one point and he didn't know if he wanted to trust that. <coughs> so instead, we decided to put a line to that Morning. Right, yeah, so I dove and see there was a big line around a, a coral reef and then a, a float and it was really new and, and good shape. So we put a line on the float and then I took another anchor and there's a dinghy and fight to the wind with Maya and to put another anchor at 45 degree. So we were holding on three points. So we were safe. You know, it was... Uh, but it was still nerve-wracking. I mean, but, yeah, well, yeah. It's, you don't want that. You don't want to have the land behind you, that's for sure. But we could not leave. And we were stuck there, so we did the best we could, and it worked out. That was the only time that we were in a position like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in a dangerous place like that. Mm -hmm. So we went down Palawan. Uh, sorry. The, yeah. Yeah, we, went down. we went down to the west of Palawan. There's a big, big island in the west of the Philippines called Palawan. And the story we were talking about earlier, the story is that when we were at the top of the Palawan, we didn't know if we were going to uh, we may be uh, encountering the pirate, not the pirates, but the extremist Muslim in a Sulu Sea, or if we're going to be on the other side and have that kind of weather, which was possible, early hurricane. So we did 
choose the weather instead of the pirates. Or the <laughs> <laughs> It was one of those moments, you're like, what's what's going to do? Let's see. You yeah. know, we figured, we kind of half knew, and in fact, um, one of the uh, locals had told us that he thought that we have a better chance dealing, there were, there were plenty of hidey holes along Palawan that we could go and hide in, and that's why we made that decision to go there, rather than be on the other side of Palawan and be in the Sulu Sea and, and might encounter the, the Abu Sayyaf, so. And at that point, they had started chopping people's heads off, and it was getting really crazy. So no, we weren't going that way. So we yeah. we stayed. We stayed. We were battling Mother Nature instead. And um, but what was amazing was to see Borneo, and um, and and there is um, Mount Kinabalu, um, which is the highest um, uh, mountain in Southeast Asia, um, the only alpine mountain there, and it was just gorgeous. Beautiful sight to see. We ended up at, um, when we got to um, Kota Kinabalu, which is the name of the, of the main town in that part of, um, of uh, Sabah, is the name of the state of um, the Malaysia. Northwest yeah. Borneo, that's yeah. part of Borneo. Most, most of Borneo is Indonesia. Northwest part of it is Malaysia, mm -hmm. part of it. And then in the middle of Malaysia, there is Brunei. Yeah. So and that's so where we were. We followed the coast of west, the west coast of Borneo. Yeah, and this is us at the. And there was a resort. Yeah, the Gaya. Eco, eco, eco resort. Eco resort. Yeah, we 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 grabbed a mooring there. Um, at the time, it was like five dollars a day, and it was a great spot. It was a wonderful, really calm. There was a little there was a little uh, coral uh, garden right off the boat that you could just get off and swim and snorkel and take a look at every day and. And there was a ferry going to Kota Kinabalu, which is a pretty big city with uh, all kind of uh, stores and malls. And so we used to go there and have the yeah. engine fixed and get food and get parts and you know, all kind of things. So that yeah. was a good spot. And we discovered Malaysia. We didn't know nothing about Malaysia. We were just kind of moving. And, and we were really, really happy to surprise with uh, what we find in Malaysia, the, the people and the, the trust. And it was very interesting. Yeah. So here, me and Tristan, we took a trip in, inland on the train uh, alongside the river and uh, went to uh, visit some hotels and come back. Just had a trip inside the land, that was cool. Yeah. Me and Maya, we stayed with the cat. <laughs> <laughs> we made our, our way down um, Borneo um, to the Singapore Strait, um, which has to have more uh, cargo ships than you can ever imagine seeing in one place. And it, a tanker, because they have a lot of. Uh, refinery there so there's a lot of time. big 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 tanker so you're kind of slaloming against the, around the, the, the cargo ships mm -hmm. yeah we we made our way um, through the Malacca Strait and um, and ended up heading up to um, Langkawi which is um, at the at the uh, close to the border of course the border of Thailand and exactly. we spent a year uh, between Malaysia and Thailand playing with the, the visa situation where <laughs> Malaysia will give us three months and then we have an overnight to sell to uh, Thailand and Thailand will give us one month. So sometimes it will take us two weeks to do the one night uh, <laughs> because we stop everywhere and then they don't know where you live, they don't know where you come from, then, so we could play yeah. play that for a year and everybody does it and it's just normal. So uh, yeah. that, was the, that was the way to do it. And that's Langkawi. Yeah, that's Langkawi. Um, and, um, this is a uh, Kua. This is in Kua, the main town, and they had just had um, one of their countrymen had just done a circumnav um, uh, solo, and um, and so they had started a new sailing program to make more sailors of the Malaysians, and so uh, they had a free Optimus program to any kid who wants to sail. And uh, Tristan, there he is, decided to jump right in. And <laughs> he loved the idea of running his own boat. I'm just doing what other people say, but yeah, totally dug it. And yeah, and you, the ladies, they're so cool. They're really great. And uh, they are the men dance. Yeah, big time. And then we ended up, um, then we were heading up to Thailand for New Year's. We spent Christmas in, in Malaysia and in Thailand. Um, everybody would meet in, um, yeah, go Patong. to Patong Beach. Phuket, in Phuket, in Phuket. Uh, on the west side. 
from the island. There is a place called Patong, very, very touristic. And uh, the 31st of December and the, first of, the 31st of December, people like boats are coming from everywhere. You can see masts. And yeah, during the day, it, all the time, people are coming and anchoring and coming and anchoring. And you have like six, 700 boats yeah. meeting there. It's, it's kind of one of the yeah. things that cruisers from the area do every year. So they meet people they haven't seen in years. Yeah. And it's a big party on the beach. And people go from boat to boat. And it's just it's a fun. big, big yeah. huge party. It's, it's like three so, days of partying, basically. So we were there for <laughs> one true. year. You, yeah, our friend Ingrid is here. And we met them there. Um, their family on New Year's Eve at this place, so it's really cool that you're here. You're so happy. But yeah, it was it was great. And it's it's like the Baba U group in the same way. Certain time of year, all the boats that happen to be in that part of the world all end up in the same place. Because of the season. Because, because of the season. You cross oceans at a certain time of the year. So you have to meet, you know, people are all congregating in the same place and then all living more or less in the same place to cross oceans. Yeah, and so Maya finally met, she finally met her tribe this group. Oh yeah. All the teenage boys and Maya's cat all hanging out and it was great. Actually it was a really, really good group of kids and they all had some really great times together and it made, this was a turning point for Maya. Um, that, that idea that, that his dream was her nightmare no longer was the reality. Now her life began. Is she still in contact with those guys? What's that? What's the question? I said, is she still in contact with her friends from the from these trips? Yeah, some of them. Yeah, yeah some of them. Yeah, she she definitely kind of knows where they kind of keep track of each other. I think more than anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But this this was really a turning point for her. In Phuket, she started um, during that. We decided to spend that year between Malaysia and Thailand, um, and she. Um, joined the Phuket Riding Club and started riding horses, you know, five days a week, seven o'clock in the morning, waking her father up, get that dinghy down, come on, we got, I got to get to, you know, I got to get the tuk tuk to get to the, to, you know, to go ride my horse before it gets too hot, you know, so, <laughs> but it was great, it was a wonderful uh, situation and opportunity that we could not have afforded here, but there it was very reasonably priced, and so, she really became quite the horsewoman during that time, and she had a good time. And uh, this is Thailand again. So uh, there's a shipyard in Phuket called Ratanachai, and it's a huge shipyard. A lot of boats do their bottom there. So here we took the boat out and actually paid somebody to work on the boat, which was a first. First time in our lives, <laughs> and first and last. Spray, case spray. <laughs> They spread the boat, then we had to re repainted the white part, the hole, and then did, of course, an anti fouling and repaired the old thing under the water. And, uh, that's and that's it. So we spent some time meeting new, new boats there and uh, adding a, uh, a job, yeah. job that definitely need to be done every three years or what, you know. And so, yeah, we're in there with these great big fishing boats and all kinds of things. I mean, it was like, you know, every kind of boat you can imagine was in this uh, shipyard. Is it both fiberglass or metal? Is it, is it fiberglass, fiberglass or steel? Yeah, the boat Imani is a combination of cedar, strip, strip plank cedar, fiberglass with epoxy, and then plywood. Yeah. Yeah, composite plywood. Yeah, she's a um, she's designed by Roger Simpson, an Australian designer. She's an Aussie designer. So when we left, um, we left Thailand in uh, 2003 in January and, um, and cross the Indian Ocean. Um, we, were good. we would love to have stopped in Sri Lanka and India on the way, but um, the visas for four of us was really prohibitive and so we couldn't afford to stop. So we had to just keep going and we made our way to the Maldives and, um, and had a quick uh, uh, refueling there and then made our way to Oman which was the, our first landing on the, um, on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, in, in Salala, at that point, when we arrived, it was probably, um, I guess we got there probably February. We spent, spent a month there. We did our taxes and all kind of stuff you got to do. And um, no, it's true. We, you do taxes all around the world. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> but we did it. And we get it, you know, but you, it takes time. You got to organize you know, with the accountant and the email, and at that point, faxing, and it was just a little crazy. But 
We actually did it, and um, so we spent about a month in Salala, and, um, and it was at the point, it was 03, the beginning of um, the Iraq war was about to start. Um, we were in a port where all the coalition um, navies were coalescing. Uh, it was very hot um, at that point. Um, and yet, you know, you know, there we were, these little yachts, making our way to the Red Sea to go up to the Red Sea for the right season. You know, it's a, it's a timing story. Um, and this, and we were poised to, to start to go north. Um, where just before we left, we found out that a boat, a, another cruising boat that we knew had actually been, um, been boarded and robbed. Um, well, they had left just a, a, you know, like a few days before us, you know, we're about to leave. And so we decided, um, and we heard them on, what happens is there's a morning net of all the boats um, talking on the, on the HF radio, on the uh, high frequency radio at eight o'clock every morning and everybody would give their position in weather and what's going on and what the news was. It was kind of like this, our six o'clock news happened every day. And, um, and those guys, uh, when, when we left, right after we left, um, a few days later, we were making our way with other boats. We decided to go in a convoy because um, we felt that it would be better to be with a group at least. Um, so we left with four other yachts and, um, and we were crossing um, we were heading towards almost at the, um, at the, not too far from the Gulf of Aden when, um, when we saw something on the horizon that looked a little suspicious. And at that moment, it was eight o'clock in the morning, the net was on, and the guys who got hit the week before were giving their report about what happened. And they were explaining their experience. And we see these three boats on the horizon and the other boats that we're convoying with, they're like, that looks really, you know, they all kind of look the same. That's not, that's unusual. That's kind of no, weird. they're pointing at us, they're yeah. going straight at us too. So yeah, and they're coming <laughs> toward So it's like, what, you know, so we asked him, what, what did those boats look like that, that got you last week? And he, they gave a description and, and the other guy, one of the other boats, um, he says, well, they're here, we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Um, we at that point started our engine, really started to move. You know, um, we started to to run basically. Um, and there were three open boats. Yeah, basically they are a safe boat from cargo ship. So they have a small diesel, diesel uh, one cylinder. They're just an emergency boat for a cargo ship, and they load them up with people from Somalia, and they bring them to Oman to uh, Yemen. To Yemen, you know, which is unfortunately happening. happening a lot now in Europe, in the Mediterranean. So they do take people from Africa to the Arabian Peninsula, and then we happen to cross path. And luckily, we were ahead of the game. We saw them, we accelerated, we put our engine full speed, so they could not catch up. But they follow one boat, follow us for half an hour, mm -hmm. shooting in the air and trying to catch the last boat, which was not us. So we were in front. Yeah. Good. They were going to catch the last boat, then they didn't catch anybody. And but it was up. scary. It was scary. I have to well, say, yeah. I, I, you know, it was that. That was a one. I mean, even with the typhoon, you know, that's another kind of scary. But this was really a visceral fear that I have to say, I I was sweating bullets, mm -hmm. and I was thinking at the time because I think like if they board us, what can we afford to to lose? So we were doing stuff like taking the cash and splitting it up in different places in the boat and hiding places like that took my wedding rings, put them in with the Legos. I'm like, I'm, I'm taking the, 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 old, the camera. old camera and I'm putting it on and I'm hiding the good camera somewhere else. The old binoculars, put those over there by the, by the door and hide the good ones. Because there's things that are, that when you're on this boat and doing this life that are essential, that you have to have these tools. These tools are what make it happen. So it was like, you know, I was already thinking, trying to think of, those things that we really couldn't afford to lose, you know, and, and putting them in places that would not be easy to find. And yet giving and being prepared to give them something, you know what I mean, to, so that they wouldn't feel that you were holding out, but you know, here, yeah, okay, you want my such and such, here it is. Were you yes. armed? No, we were not armed. We were traveling with, with small children and we don't know guns. Mm -hmm. And I gotta tell you this much, if you're gonna carry a gun, you gotta be prepared. 
to you shoot know first brands. because it's not, it's not, you can't brandish, you can't, you know, that, that doesn't work. We've, we've seen no. bad experiences around that. No, it was not, it was not in the cards for us. We were not going to travel with guns. Yeah, that's what happened to Blake in in, uh, in, in the Amazon when he came out uh, with his gun, and then some guys were on the boat already with gun, trying to steal his his big boat, uh, research selling boat, and he came out uh, with his gun, thinking he was going to scare them. They saw him, they just shot him. That was it. So you shoot first, you don't ask questions, then, and okay. you have to be prepared to just kill somebody. Just anyway, so we ended up. Um after that run, because we used a lot of our fuel, because we don't usually go that fast, but under power, we had to go into Yemen. So we went into the Gulf of Aden, and this was uh, who came and met us at the entrance of the harbor with these guys with these guns, and it was, that was more fear, you know? We first saw them, like, oh my God, here we go. But actually, they were our escorts. And they brought us, they said, we heard about what had happened to you guys. Because we've been called, we called the coalition. Um, we called the U.S. Navy. They knew what had happened. I mean, it was a, we were all over the radio. You know, all the folks heard about it and knew what was happening with us. So they wanted us to, they wanted to debrief us at the, with the port captain. And then they gave us a driver to show us Aiden. And it was amazing, we had so much fun. That was really, really such a cool experience to actually see. Um, a country that doesn't see a lot of tourism. That's Mark um, in the middle with uh, our driver, Salim, and this other guy who insisted on getting in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Because I tell you, these guys in Yemen, they like getting their picture taken. They are not shy. They are not shy. Everybody was grinning and take my picture, me, me, me. It was really just unlike a lot of places. Did you have to wear a burqa? No, I didn't have to wear a burqa. No, it wasn't that. Yeah. I wore, um, I, I just wore, you, you wanted to cover your arms. Um, and so I was, you wore very light trousers and, um, and just, just down to you, just cover your arms, basically. Yeah, it was, that was, they were fine with that, yeah. So we went into the Red Sea, and we ended up in Eritrea, and that was my first step on uh, African soil, and wow, that was so cool. We, we loved Eritrea. Um, and we made our way from the um, anchorage. Um, at this point, we're in the, we're in the midsection, heading up the mountain to Asmara, which is the capital city. And there it is. It's a really cool, cosmopolitan, interesting place where, where they make a lot of those Italian shoes. This is it. Pizza, Colonia, corn stores, all the Italian cheese. It was really Pastries. espresso, pastry. It was really like <laughs> black, black Italy. It was. It was really wild. It was wonderful. Very and interesting. There's a real cafe. Curious. Yeah real cafe culture, you know, everybody sitting in the cafe in the morning, in the evening, in the night, I mean, it was just constant. It was great. We had a really wonderful time visiting Asmara. And then heading back to Misawa, you get like, every, you get like all, the, all the seasons, you know, down here is summer for sure, and this was uh, outside of a market that was the Camel parking lot. <laughs> and from there we headed up to Sudan through Sudan. We couldn't get off the boat. That's another place where we couldn't afford the visas. So, um, but they do allow you, because of weather, you have to kind of hide, because sometimes when the northers blow, you can't, you can't, get, you can't get through. So you just got to go wait for weather. So these are some of the beautiful places you get to wait. And like fjords, they call the Masa, and they go inland like a river, and you motor inside, and there's coral reef everywhere. It's the best diving that we've ever seen everywhere soft coral and very clear water and a lot of fishes so there's not a very a culture of fishing down there for some reason so uh, it's very very it's full of fish it's gorgeous really amazing very very poor and this, yeah. this gentleman came and uh, asked us if we had any water to share yeah that was the first so, time we'd ever had a fisherman ask anybody ask us for, for water yeah. sugar oil he was really looking for those. So we gave him some food and some old sail that we had, so could help a little bit. But uh, yeah, it was very, very poor. 
at the Tree Valley that uh, when we sail, we always have lines in the back trolling, and uh, so we catch those big, beautiful, delicious fish from time to time. Yeah. And as we go up north in the, in the Red Sea, we reach Egypt. And we left the boat in... Yeah, in the Suez Canal, we, um, we, we crossed the canal halfway, and we left the boat there. And, um, and a friend of mine who I'd gone to college with, she was working with USAID, um, she and her husband, and so um, they were in Cairo, so they came and picked us up and brought us to Cairo for a week. And that was wonderful, as well as going to Luxor, I mean, to see the ruins. I mean, I'm, it's so sad what's happening in, in Egypt right now because this is all so magical. And yeah, there we are in Luxor, the whole family. So we saw two of those dead floating core in the Mediterranean. <laughs> so basically, I know we had no idea why a dead core, but we learned after that when we stopped in France that there is a special cargo ship who come to France and then they load up cows to bring to Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates, and etc. And then if they die, they then they don't. can't sell them, so they just throw them overboard. And two of them we actually saw. Two different cows. The oddest thing. So yeah. that, that, Sail that's, by cows. That's actually yeah. back to Egypt yeah, in the Nile. We took a trip on the on the local boat with some other yeah. some other cruiser for one day. We went uh, experiencing the, the boat, and then after, so we passed the Suez Canal and then uh, crossed north uh, to Turkey. That's a really magic place, the southwest coast of Turkey. Yeah. And that's a little fjord. So obviously here we are, six five boats. Partying, uh, swimming, windsurfing, eating, fishing, etc., etc., and having a great time in the summer in the Med. So we spent the summer on the Med in the Med, going from Turkey to uh, Greece, and then pretty fast to south of France, where I was born. So Here we are. This, this is in um, in Calgary. This is in. Um, so that's in next Greece. to Rhodes. Yeah. It's a little out, a fishing outboat next to Rhodes on the island. A really gorgeous place. Uh, that's. Uh, yeah. That's Simi. Simi next to Rhodes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Tira or Santorini. Santorini. Of course, that's an amazing volcano. But uh, we sail in. Oops. Call them and they try to push Six. the other guy in the water. So that, and then, yeah. So <laughs> there's music and there's obviously a lot of people and it's, uh, they all come from different villages from uh, the south, where they are both, and that's what they do. <laughs> And, and this yes. is cousins, brothers and sisters, nieces, nephew, who yeah. came, the Gunnar clan. <laughs> came to visit us. Uh, we only spent 10 days in France, uh, so we had to go and pick up friends in uh, the Balearals, so we, we, we're on a schedule. Yeah. Mark, uh, did you have charts for all these places? Or you were yeah, I yeah. always have paper charts, yeah. 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 We had a, paper charts. a CMAP, a system on the computer in case of emergency, so we could Connect the computer. I mean, I have charts from the computer, but I, I don't, I don't have the computer on all the time because it just uses a lot of power, and we are limited from solar panels and wind generator. We don't get any other source of electricity, but from the solar panel and the wind generator. So, uh, so I'm always limiting the consumption of electricity. That's a priority. So. Did you buy them ahead of time or just? Uh, yeah, yes and no. No, you you meet people and you photocopy them yep. or you trade them. Yeah. Or, so it's yeah, constant it's as you go along. Different ways, yeah, yeah. So you're collecting but, charts. Yeah, we always have paper charts. Yeah. So we made our way um, through. Uh, we we went to Barcelona and the and through the Balears um, to uh, Mallorca, Ibiza, and then. Um, ended up down in Gibraltar, and there we had a whiteout. <laughs> that was one of the most ferocious storms that we had. It's like, oh my God! It was, it was, it was right around Halloween, and we realized it was really time to get down to the Canaries because it was, you know, yeah. fall was really here. Just behind those boats, there's a big rock from Gibraltar that we can't see. It's right yeah. behind there. It is in the shadow. It's, it's, you it's can't there. see it, but um, it's there. And that's an anchorage. That's actually on the Spain Spanish side, yeah. and it's right La next Lina. to Gibraltar. And the boat anchor there. Now we're on our way to to, to the Canaries. Oh yeah, way better. And from there, we cross the Atlantic. In the middle of the trip, we start. We ran out of wind. 
It got really quiet. We light wind. We yeah. have 10 days of very light wind right in the middle of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So So whenever we run out of wind, we make pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just the thing to do, everybody. When it all, you know, gets and quiet, it's time to make. And I went to work. I, I made jewelry for 10 days uh, because we have... Uh, I had no more inventory. And, and we're, so. we're going so slow, you made the kids get off the boat and, and with their with the scrubbers and scrub the bottom of the boat while we were sailing, because we're going that slow. Um, so we went to, uh, after, uh, the crossing is happening and we arrived in St. Bart, where uh, I sold a lot of jewelry there in one store, which was needed. And then this lady told me where to go. So I went, we went to other islands and went to different stores and I sold more work and made more money. And then eventually Maya had met uh, a boyfriend in uh, Thailand and he was in the Bahamas. And so we had to go to the Bahamas. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, nobody else had any specific place they needed to go to but Maya. She's like, well, we have to go to the Bahamas. Can we go there? I said, okay, sure. sure. <laughs> What's your question? So is sure. this where your dream turns into a nightmare? <laughs> is this when your dream turns into a nightmare, Mark? Is... I turn the, uh, the other way and put some incense candle and pray. And everything went well. He was a boy from a good family. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So we're so very lucky. So. We actually, so we went to the Bahamas to go hang out. Uh, we were there for, I don't know, a couple months almost. And, um, and, and they have a big regatta that happens in Georgetown at Great Azuma. And, uh, and we you know, partook in all that stuff that was going on and the kids really had a great time. But then it was time to go. And it was March and we had to make a move because we, we had to get down to Panama and get back before the Pacific, cycle, um, Pacific uh, hurricane season here. So um, we needed to make a move. So we actually left Maya with, uh, with the other family. And because um, she had to be back here in April to take her um, high school um, proficiency exam to, to, to test out of high school so she could go to the college in Marin in September. And that was her plan. So we are all about the plan in our family. So we accommodated that. And, and so she got another uh, three weeks um, on the Dawn Treader, which was the name of our, our friend boat. And, um, and we, me, Mark, and Tristan, we left and took the boat to Jamaica and, um, and then on to Panama. Panama, on Panama Canal. And here's a little anecdote. I, we don't have a sewing machine. I got one now. I'm running to sew. It's my new thing. But then we didn't have a sewing machine. So I had a piece of plywood. And every time we go somewhere, I put my basic colors and paint the flag. Put it in the in the mast, and nobody tell me anything. So that was Panama flag there, in painted <laughs> two days before we get to. Panama. And they're always perfect, you know. They never fray. You yeah, know. It's, I told them, it's the same piece of wood ended up being many flags, <laughs> just repainted on top of it. And you just need very basic colors, and I just saw another guy on the catamaran doing that too. Yeah, I was not the only person. Yeah, it was, yeah, it, it totally made sense from afar. It's fun, you know. And, and that was the thing because every country you go to, you do have to fly the flag of the, yeah, of the country the, that you're in. That's required. Oops, where am I? Sorry. Here we are. Here we are. Imani's in the canal. Wow, that was pretty crazy. In there with those big boats, and yeah, it's it's a, it's an it's an amazing. Um, Piece of engineering, no question. Very narrow. Yeah. I know, and it just feels it when you're in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we are at the last lock, um, about to head into the Pacific Ocean, and um, and it's pretty special. We're like, oh my God, we can't believe we did it, and we did it in one day. We crossed the Panama Canal in a day, um, by, because you know they say that you got to do eight knots through the through the lake at the top, you know, first the, the what happens is the locks bring you up the mountain, basically, and you get up top there, and then you're in this you're in this in this flooded what used to be something else, but you see the tops of the trees still sticking out. Um, and there's a channel that you have to follow. But the guy told us the pilot that's on the boat, because you have a pilot who's telling you exactly what to do. And he told us that we couldn't fly the mainsail, but we could fly a headsail. So 
We had just gotten this great big spinnaker from Ingrid's boat, from, from the Dawn Treaders when we left them in the Bahamas, and we said, we've got we've to head sail to the spinnaker. And that's what we flew. <laughs> And that's how we made our eight, nine knots going across that lake. And um, it was great. I mean, the, the pilot, he was so excited. He said, now this is fun. Because <laughs> usually he's in cargo ships and, you know, just put, 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 and he said, no, this is a, because we had to really muscle that sail around and really use it, you know, because we had to follow the actual dog legs of the, of the of the channel. Yeah, which is jiving the yeah. wind, so yeah. doing zigzag in the channel. And, yeah. But then we had more weight, you know, these catamaran don't like weight, so suddenly we had four big people on top of all our stuff. Because you have to have line you have to have line handlers. Um, so you have to have lines and all that stuff, yeah, it's a lot. Extra fenders and then people. So But we did it. And we did fine. it in the day, so we were very proud of that. <laughs> and then it took us as a slow And then we had the plan was to make Panama San Francisco non-stop in one in one leg, but uh, the wind the wind was not there, so we did uh, Panama Acapulco, Acapulco and then weeks. refueled, got some more water, more food, and then did the coast again all the way to Puerto Vallarta and then Capo San Luca, and then we as shore. we've done many times, and there's a chart there for people who are interested. I brought a photocopy. We did. Uh, Porto Vallarta, no, sorry, Cabo San Luca to here with the old clipper route. When the boat didn't have any engine, they had to use the wind. So and so they had to go out at sea, follow the coast, free 400 miles, turn right, and head for San Francisco. So that we've done that four or five times. Yeah. And next time we go to Hawaii yeah. and we come back from Hawaii because it's, <laughs> it's really tiring. <laughs> it's I'm too old for that. Now. It's not fun. <laughs> yeah, that was just a young spry thing then, not anymore. <laughs> We did. We got back in um, in, uh, in June uh, 18th, 04. Um, it was a four and a half year um, circumnav, and um, it was really a, a really an amazing thing to do. I have to say, and uh, and we're still here. It was my dream when I was nine years old. So I guess. Uh, oh, wow. it was Yeah, the photo you see of uh, was, yeah. Pipi Dawn, that that's when the wave came in the, in the middle there. There was a, an arm of, la of, of land and then washed up everything. Yeah, that was... Yeah, that's true. Definitely. All uh, of that area got, yeah. got hit real hard. Yeah. That's true. That was a year after we got back, actually, so we didn't have that. And all our friends that were still there, they all um, had time to... They were on their boats, most of them, because it was 9 in the morning, and they just lifted anchor and went to sea. So everybody was fine. Actually, that were there. Yeah, people in Marina actually in uh, Lankawi, there's a, an island with a marina in the middle. They just dig the island and made a marina, and then most of the boat sank because the wave came in. And mm -hmm. some people had time to cut their line and just get out because yeah. they they were stuck. they were smart enough and ready to to go, but most of the boat just sank right inside the marina. It's hard. So yeah, it's, uh, sure. uh, yeah. in the uh, Marquesas, I was there in '82. Mm -hmm. um, when you guys were there, when I was there at nighttime, the whole village would disappear, and I'd walk around. I'd find them all sitting in front of the one TV, watching soap operas. It was American soap operas dubbed into English or dubbed French. into French. Uh, was it like that when you were there? And well, they have French programs uh -huh. uh, for made in France or made in Papete, so from local local news, local uh, news from Tahiti. And local program from Tahiti mixed with program from France. So. But they all had televisions at that point, um, pretty much. Um, and, and they were getting all the French televisions coming straight to them. It was like they were in Paris. Oh, right. It was really, yeah, it was interesting in that sense. Yeah, you see that. And the internet is yeah. definitely there, so, so people yeah. have access to it. Because we arrived, there was, it was 2000 at that point. Oh, what are our kids doing now? I'll show you those kids. Um, Maya um, graduated from 
uh, Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts in uh, 2009. And now she is um, working in Amherst and living in Amherst um, for a animation uh, uh, internet gaming studio. Um, she's a producer. Wow. Um, and Tristan, and there we are, we're in DC this summer because we brought him, he transferred from, and both of these kids transferred from College of Marin, I wanna say, which was really, <laughs> absolutely um, a wonderful institution. Um, Tristan just transferred to George Washington University. He's a computer science major yeah. as a sophomore. So he is in his first uh, semester of his sophomore year right now. And uh, yeah, they're coming home in December. They just got their itineraries for the, for, the, <laughs> for the Christmas trip back home. So yeah, they're good, they're good. I think that um, uh, Maya has told me now that when she has kids, she's gonna homeschool her kids too. Uh, which I never expected her to say. I mean, really, but yeah, she's like, no, it was good. So yeah, they're good, they're good kids. All y'all are special, and that's why we're here. We're Sausalito people. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Thank you.